I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Download Veely now. A sneak ahead to me is when your wife comes home with groceries and she can't find room on the floor in the kitchen to put the groceries down because it's full of shoes and boxes and you're trying to figure out what's what, that's when you know you got a problem and that problem is being a sneak ahead. So I show up on the morning of, and it's just insanity. There's hundreds of people on the block. Cops are already there, and they're asking, what the hell's going on over here? And the kids would not move. And the cops are saying, if y'all don't move, we're going to start arresting you guys. Kids been sleeping out there for four days. They're not moving, you know what I mean? So cops start arresting kids. And one kid was like holding on to the gate like he wouldn't let go. On top of that, there were people that brought weapons to the thing. They brought baseball bats, there were knives, there was a machete found, like a fucking jungle machete. We then had to set up a, a way for them to exit out the back door of our store, and the police actually set it up so that taxis were waiting outside the back, and the police were like, just get in the cab and get out of this neighborhood. And it's all over a pair of basketball shoes. Can I kick it? Sneakerhead is someone who learned Roman numerals by collecting Jordans. The word sneaker is usually attributed to Henry Nelson McKinney, an advertising man who popularized the phrase way back in 1917. Since Marquise Converse founded his classic company, kicks have transitioned from the playground all the way to the runway. As recently as 50 years ago, consumers had far fewer choices. You could get your cons, first dubbed all-stars, in high or low top and only made of canvas. They're everywhere. The German company Adidas, founded originally by the Dossler brothers, introduced leather and suede sneakers into the marketplace in the early 1970s. When pro players in the Harlem Rucker tournament started wearing them, an entire new world opened up. The early 80s saw the emergence of brands like Reebok and Puma, but the true watershed moments came in the mid-1980s. In 1984, the first Air Jordan dropped. On September 15th, Nike created a revolutionary new basketball shoe. On October 18th, the NBA threw them out of the game. Okay, so, but what's wrong with the coloring? This, uh, what, what, what rule do we violate here? Well, it doesn't have any white in it. Uh huh? <laughs> well, well, neither does the NBA. Two years later, Run DMC released their hit song, My Adidas, and encouraged 16,000 fans to hold up their Adidas at Madison Square Garden. My Adidas, one, two, three, four, ten, four, four, all the crowd, I see them, four, I stepped on day, I lie, eight, all the people. 
The boom of signature kicks in this era provided the necessary elements to birth a community where the goal was to wear the freshest, hardest to find, limited edition models that have grown to almost mythic proportions. What began as a subculture is now omnipresent. I think you can definitely trace it connected to the, the growth of hip hop where white kids in the suburbs, they didn't want to look preppy anymore. They wanted to have a little more flavor because they love the music, so they want to dress like that, so they just bought the same sneakers. And I think that's absolutely the turning point. You know, you talk about the beginning stages of like the Adidas shell toe, Air Force One, high. I think sport had a lot to do with that because sports along the way stopped being just about athletics. It became pop culture. So we looked at pop culture and made it mean something more to us than just average things like, is it good leather? So Run DMC, my Adidas, with the way they wore Adidas, they had the first endorsement deal for a non-athlete with the million dollar contract with Adidas. Hip hop started going mainstream, then what rappers wore started going mainstream. It's street culture. As hip hop emerged and this new style culture that came along with the Jordans, skateboarding came along the same way and blended all aspects of design and street culture. Hip hop, skateboarding, and sneakers have changed the world. Athletes wanted to be rappers, rappers wanted to be athletes, you know, like everyone had a clothing line and a record deal. Musician, entertainer, movie star, those things are seamless now, they've really merged. Somewhere along the lines in the last 10 years, kids started to really look for that third party validation. And because music is such a big cog in our cultural wheel, you pay attention to what these musicians are doing. It's the kids trying to emulate their heroes by wearing the same thing they wear. Their idols, their icons rock this. So for them, it's like, oh, it's a piece of them that I can take home with me and I can come correct. You know, I think you had a whole generation of people looking to wear sneakers whenever they possibly could. You know, and norms shifted. History, technology, design, celebrities, retail, business, all this stuff all packaged into one subject, one culture that a lot of people can relate to even if they aren't collectors. The UPS man, he might have some chocolate Adidas on or Nikes. <laughs> sneakers are everywhere. Before we go any further, Let's get a few simple terms out of the way. Colorway refers to the combination of colors used in a particular release. Retro is a shoe that has been reintroduced, sometimes with a few cosmetic differences. Collab refers to the marriage of an outside artist or designer with a particular model, as in Jeff Staples' legendary Pigeon Dunk or Frank the Butcher's New Balance 999 Kennedy. Deadstock is a brand new shoe that has never been worn, offered in its original box, often collecting dust in some shoe store basement. Limited Edition is a shoe produced in limited quantities and only available through a handful of retailers. Nike calls these quick strikes. I would love to have every Jordan, but I don't know how attainable that would be. Any of these shoes that you see in here, I do not wear. The only Jordans that I do wear would be Jordans that I have two of, or three. Collecting became big about five years ago with the whole idea of the one to stock, one to rock. We'll be in bed, he'll be on the internet, he'll get up at three o'clock in the morning to the releases. I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, it's almost five o'clock, the releases are coming out, I'm gonna get online, and I just hear the F-bomb droppies because he didn't get it, and... It's a game. I mean, it's that's part of what this is about, is who's up the earliest, who's the fastest. Some people probably look and they look at me and say, you yeah, know, it's really strange that, that you enjoy the, doing this that much. It definitely became a part of, of my life, um, the, cult, the culture, uh, the stores I visit, where we go. His own little world. A sneakerhead, to me, is somebody who appreciates the sneaker culture as a culture, uh, as an art, and um, somebody who appreciates buying a sneaker as more than just buying an article of clothing. I've been a die-hard sneakerhead since the sixth grade. 
I remember going to the store, and my dad, you know, looks over and he goes, you like those? I'm like, yeah, I love these. And I'm in, you know, I'm in fifth grade, you know what I'm saying? And he's like, all right, get them. And I'm like, hey, for real? And he's like, yeah. I bought a pair of Jordan 3s. I felt like I was part of a, a crew. I felt like I was in on a secret. I had to buy something every time I went in there because I just wanted to, like, I wanted to, the salesman to, to think I was cool. When I was about seven or eight, my uncle gave me a pair of Pro Keds. First shoe that I had to have was, no doubt, a Chuck Taylor. First pair of kicks that I was really excited about was the Diamond Turf ones. They were in the clearance. They didn't come with a box or nothing. And, but I, I got them, you know what I'm saying? Those were my first pair of, like, you know, like, cool shoes. And, you know, from that moment on, it was on. Now I got the shoes that the 16, 17-year-old guys on my block are wearing. So now I feel totally different. The metrics we had to evaluate one another was that chain or that ring or those shoes. You know, when you meet a guy, he's like, hey, man, what's up, man? Hey, good to see you, man. Damn. Wow. There's a handful of things that can define who you are without saying a word, and your shoes are one of those. That first pair of sneakers changed the way that I looked at everything. It was all about definitely the brand. You could have a great looking shoe, and it could be a spalding, and people be like, what, what is that? And, as soon as you say, oh, man, I got a, a, a Wilson on, they be like, fuck you. You know what I mean? We wanted to be as fresh as those guys who were achieving amazing things. It's connected to an emotion. It's connected to a, a moment in time. I thought aesthetically it was going to be really cool, right, to throw a vault in your house. But uh, I don't know if they make a safe large enough to put all the stuff I wanted to put in that safe to make sure that when I leave, you know, I have peace of mind that my shoes and collection are protected. So for a lot of people, it's about the sneakers, and it's about that whole sneaker culture. For me, it really started with just looking up to, to Michael Jordan as an athlete. The more you get involved, the more time consuming it is and the more overwhelming it can be. I'm just trying to get Air Jordans, and that in and of itself consumes, you know, a big old chunk of my day every single day. So I'll tell you what, like, nothing gets me more excited than seeing that Memphis uh, written across the United States of America. That means we got something good in the mail. So we'll see what we got on this one here. You just go with the straight rip. Looks like some Jordan 3s by the looks of the box. A little powder blue, so that's a pretty good day, right? like maybe a Air Jordan 10 retro. Chicago Bulls, this is a new colorway. Retro for the very first time. Nice little tumbled leather right there. Yeah, it's nice, you know, this is what, this is what, gets, you, uh, this is what gets you excited. Guess we'll take them into the vault, huh? It's a good spot for them. A sneaker head is someone who gets a little tingle in their stomach when they hear the word exclusive colorway. Before internet, you had to either know some place, know someone, or know something to get your hands on certain releases. The art of the hunt was the discovery. So when, it, when I wanted to see what new sneaker was coming out, I had to leave my house, walk to downtown Worcester, go to Kangaroo Crossing, look up at the chalkboard, see what the fuck is happening. You know, you would go to a sneaker store and see something on the wall, and that might be the first time you ever saw it. We used to go all the way to Yonkers to go see Packers shoes just to see what does he have. And then it was, what do you have downstairs? It was a contact sport back then. I had to get out and touch and feel and, and figure things out. There was no easy way to do it. We would go to a store like Foot Locker or Athletes or Models, and we would look at the whole wall, and we'd be like, ooh, this one on the bottom shelf, I bet my boy didn't pick. That's the one I'm going to make hot. And we made it hot by what we rocked it with. It was just about picking that flavor off the wall that, that you were gonna bang people in the head the next day. 
Prior to the internet, if you were really a sneaker collector, you would have to travel to different cities to get certain models. And there was actually this I-95 corridor between New York, Baltimore, and Philly, especially for Air Force Ones. I would take a bus to New York to go discover things. Oh, look at this Air Force One. It says NYC on the side. Why? I would take that shoe and I'll bring it back to Massachusetts. You were in Baltimore and you walked into Charlie Rudo's and he had these sneakers. And then he told you, oh, we'll probably get a new color next month. And then you're like, oh my God, how do I get to Charlie Rudo's to see if he got a new color? In my age, it was like, oh, there's a shoe that came out in Tokyo. I need to book a flight to Tokyo, get a hotel, figure out the guy that I need to talk to to get like the hookup to get in on that line, and then buy it, and then gotta get home with it. Now you, you're bringing a pair of shoes home. You met 40 people and traveled 8,000 miles to get. So back then, these things really meant something to me. I'm a sneakerhead. I love sneakers, but I hate to say my life revolves around them. I'd rather say they revolve around me. My parents, you know, both came from uh, Croatia. Oh, my dad was just real old world. They've been supportive in different ways, but they've also, you know, never understood it. It's hard to understand. What do you think? You have a, a room full of shoes, and they say, oh, you're doing something with it. You're taking a break from your future to do shoes. I said, don't worry about it. This is something that's going to, it's going to work. My collection holds about 2,500, but uh, left over here is probably about a, maybe 1,000. The Jordan 11s came out in 96. That's when I gave up, because the black and red 11s were coming out with the patent leather. So anybody that was a blood wanted that Jordan 11, that black and red. If you're 16 years old, right, and you see like a, a big blooded out gangster cutting you in front of line, I just stepped back and I lost my pair. At that point, then I started looking on the internet. That's when we found Nike Park, Nike Talk, and we found eBay. I was going to school in finance. So what I did, I bought like a couple extra pairs, put them up on eBay, sold them for like 20 bucks more and got my pair for free. Boom, it just opened up my eyes. These are the, the Paris Dunks. Bernard Buffet's artistry was sublimated on the canvas. It's kind of like where Nike SB really just took off. Wu-Tang Dunk Highs. This is probably one of the last few like brand new dead stock pairs out there. So Dre, what's your security for all this? You know, I have my dad and his two by four. That's good enough uh, security right there. There's no hunt anymore. It's, yo, this is where it's gonna be at. This is how many pairs it's gonna be. Information destroyed what a guy like me would know to be the sneaker game. So the boom, early 90s. It's a whole different game, you know? I remember when eBay was, we'd search eBay, you type in the word Nike Dunk, and maybe 28 searches come up. You type it now, there's 50,000, you know, listings. It's, it's just too, it's so saturated. Sneakers are just a byproduct of that, you know, uh, corporate takeover, which is now every shoe is limited, every shoe is a collab, every shoe is a retro, every era of sneakerdom exists simultaneously. Now with the internet, with reselling, with the right price, you can get any shoe you want. That's the great thing, is you can be a sneakerhead from anywhere. If you were a kid in Iowa before the internet, where do you go? When you have so much and at such a high frequency, they mean less to you. There's a difference between like looking online, looking on eBay, clicking bid and buy, two days later, FedEx two day, you get it in, in the mail and you open it up and it's, it's there and you put it on your feet and you rock it. I think there's a bit of like, okay, now what's next? I gotta find the next thing, you know what I mean? I call Nike's unlimited edition. I don't believe any of it. Conceptually, we modeled it after a bodega, and it's pretty much a perfect metaphor for the product that we carry. We designed this shop with the idea of creating a physical representation of what it is to hunt for great sneakers. The internet's great, but you don't really have to put in the work. You're just sitting behind a computer. We want to bring back that sense of discovery and people showing up and being like, oh my God, this is crazy, and then telling their neighbors and just really bringing that experience back, because that's what it's about. Five years ago, I did a project with Nike called Black Friday. I made sure no one ever saw a picture of the Black Fridays. So when the shoes came out, you had to be at the store to see what it looked like. But I gave the mystique of discovery. 
Do I want this or do I not want it? That's what we used to do. Walk in the store, see a shoe. Do I want it or do I not want it? To actually see something in person and see the quality of stitching leather uh, and interact with people within the culture, that's more important now. The dawn of the new millennium brought the internet in a sea change in the sneaker game. What was once a regional subculture became an international marketplace. もともとそのアメリカから入ってきたカルチャーもあるし、ヨーロッパから入ってきたカルチャーもあるし、それのなんかマッシュアップっていうか、それがなんか日本っぽい買ったりもするから。日本ではスポーツのファッションの距離が少
テンポユニバース。テンポイゼやノースフィリー。ペーハゼやラートウザスニーカーストア。ライカエアフォースバーン1982オリジナル。エアジョーダンは1985というのは。After I graduate テンポ、I come back to the Japan. I'm working the trading company. I remember. They have a lot of their vintage shoes in the US. We do their chapter, like a really tiny, tiny store. All the new shoes is a vintage shoe. Every month I go to New Jersey, Philadelphia. I always bring back to their 200 pairs, 300 pairs. I negotiate how much? You know, like they say, you know, like $5. Oh, $5. Oh, good. You know, like I bring it to the here. You know, I sell to the $300. You know, Oh shit, you know, like I'm making to the yeah, good money, you know. A sneakerhead is a person who has OCD, obsessive consumption disorder. We have to think about what it means to、um, have a relationship with an object, like a shoe. Would you call it an obsession or an addiction or both? Both. A disease. <laughs> Yes. How do we distinguish normal collecting from hoarding disorder? You know, unfortunately, I haven't been able to determine quite yet when enough is enough. Like, there was a point in time, like, my parents, they, they wanted to know what was wrong with me. You know what I mean? It, it, it went from, from, from 3 to 30, and, and then it went from 30 to 300. It's kind of a behavioral addiction,、uh, so to speak. You want more and more and more of it. It's just been recently, maybe in the last,、uh, you know, six, seven months, that I've really thought to myself, you know what? I want them all. That's when you got a problem. You just have stacks on stacks of shoes with no purpose for them other than making sure that you own them. I have no idea how many shoes I even have anymore. I, I lost count well, I'd say well into, you know, well over a thousand at this point. That number changes every day, man. It's like the national debt. Motherfucker, like. 700s. How many pair do you have, personally? I stopped、you? counting. After, like, After what? A thousand. After a thousand? <laughs> But I didn't get obsessive until like around maybe 95, 96. And then it didn't become a problem until like 2002, 2003. You know, when I have, you know, almost 2,000 pairs of shoes. It was worse before. I might have had like 5,000. It's all that they can think about. I find myself focused on it、uh, quite a bit. If I put them all in one place, like, I probably have a panic attack. You know, it really took over. Kind of my thoughts and, and, and how I wanted to, you know, what I wanted to wear, what I wanted to spend my money on. And they、um, collect so much that it actually in, inhibits their ability to have relationships, to be able to use the rooms in their home. I would always get a two bedroom and supposedly for a studio, except it would just turn into the sneaker room. Outside, all the shit I would wear, the Jordans, the New Balances. In here is like the second wave that. I might come in here and look for something. Then the third wave is storage unit, boxes that are still taped. I've never actually been to storage to be like, I want box number three. People were like, yo, man, you got for real problems. And I'm like, yeah, I know that, man, you know, so. It's basically like Frankenstein. You know, you create a monster that needs to be fed. It's like a horror film of just the sneakers just creeping closer and closer and closer. I mean, I have so many in storage now, and they're like, I have a binder in it. Has pictures of each shoe and which box they're in and everything. Just super crazy. All of what you've acquired is going to wind up in a storage space somewhere, you know, just sort of hidden away and, and the glory of display and all the dreams you had of how you're going to set it up and show people that moment passed. Good luck with that. So, what's interesting is that Fairfax went from being a predominantly quiet Jewish. Little neighborhood in the middle of LA to being the epicenter of streetwear. Diamond Supply Company is right here. I mean, even across the street, you have KO, which has now moved down here, which is DGK and some of the biggest skate brands. So, Supreme, of course, was one of the first down here and really helped set that scene. And even now, you'll see kids lined up to get some of the new Air Force ones that cut up. You see some people like Freddie Gibbs right there. What up, sir? And this is kind of the first original consignment shop here in LA, Flight Club LA, right behind me, where every day kids are dropping off their shoes to sell. People are coming in to buy some of the rarest, most exclusive, and most importantly, kicks you can't find in any other store. 
the Buscemi brand and what we're doing here is rebelling against a steamer trunk company from the 1800s called Louis Vuitton, right? They make steamer trunks, right? But now, if you walk into a Louis Vuitton store, they have dog leashes and basketball sneakers. Like, okay, what's happening here? I don't understand. What, I don't understand what's happening, right? But then you just, if you walk down Rodeo Drive or Monte Napoleone in Milan or Central Hong Kong or any luxury market, you're basically walking into streetwear stores, right? That's what it is. Okay, we started this. So now it's time for us to take a little bit back for us. So we launched the brand with an array of accessories, and obviously we launched the brand with the 100 millimeter, which is a basketball inspired sneaker. I wanted to make the best sneaker possible, the best sneaker on the planet. How could I do that? And also to compete against, like I said, the bigger luxury brands in the world. So we took an inspiration from a very famous handbag and we kind of married it with a basketball sneaker. A real sneakerhead knows everything about sneakers, about that shoe, why it's cool, why it looks good. Beginning in the 90s, the popularity of the limited edition collab took off. Major sneaker companies began teaming up with celebrities, graffiti artists, musicians, and specialty retailers who put their own stamp on customized models released in small quantities only. These collaborations intensified the frenzy, driving more and more collectors to the burgeoning limited edition market. This all created yet another opportunity for the collector. Before sneakers, I was a trained graphic designer. So we did a lot of magazine work, editorial design, logo design. And I already had our clothing line, Staple Pigeon. That started in 97. That was really underground, but a lot of people, you know, had a strong following for Staple Pigeon as well. The day that I finally got to meet with Nike, it just clicked. They were like, wow, you're a designer. Uh, you do, you have a clothing line, you have a store, you're a sneaker head, you, you're knowledgeable about shoes. Like, we need to work together. It was easy at that point. Nike approached me and said, uh, the Dunk, which is one of the most iconic shoes, uh, we're having an anniversary, and we want to celebrate it in various cities in the world that like were epicenters of sneaker culture. So they said, we would like you guys to do the New York one if you'd be interested. And I was like, fuck yeah. <laughs> Am I allowed to curse? <laughs> okay. Would I want to do the most iconic shoe for the most iconic shoe company for the best city in the world and have me do it? Yeah, I, I think I want to do that one. You know, I was like, I was like let me think about it. Yes. <laughs> One of the reasons why we gravitated towards the pigeon is actually because of the dope colorways that just embody what the bird is. So it's like different shades of gray, and then you've got pops of white, pops of black, and then of course the pigeon pink bottom, which is a must have. In terms of material choice too, you know, we went with like a new buck over here so that it felt soft like an animal. This might have been the shoe that changed sneaker culture forever because after this hit, and after this was on the front page of the, of the papers and of the evening news, old ladies that live on Central Park West all of a sudden were now knowing that people were doing this for sneakers. It, it just opened the floodgates, to, and it was because of this guy right here. On the West Coast, brands like Asics, known for their lightweight running shoes, are now turning out one-of-a-kind collabs that sell out instantly in Beverly Hills boutiques like Blends. We know that scarcity is, is, is currency. To bolster that currency, the Asics brand has relied heavily on New York designer Ronnie Feig, owner of Kith, the current standout sneaker store in Manhattan. He gets a lot of credit for where we are today. We've made beautiful shoes in, in concert with the partners that we've collaborated with. When you look at the suede, when you look at the leathers, you look at the balance on the shoe and the way it's actually put together, it's beautiful. 70s, you got graffiti, boom, illegality. 80s, our movement surfaces, uh, gained some recognition. Keith Haring, Basquiat, you know, some famous names of street culture. The 90s, mixed media, t-shirt culture, lifestyles emerging. My first involvement with sneaker culture is like 2002, three. I was in my office one day and a man came in uh, holding my book. It turned out to be Mark Parker, who was the then kind of global creative director for Nike. And prior to that, you know, I'd never done anything on a sneaker. 
the first couple of shoes didn't have any actual artwork content on them. You know, the, uh, the FLAM shoe, FLAM is an acronym for love or money. Love or money, give me the option. If I had love or money, I'll take love. Every time, I'll take love. The dunkle, which everybody goes crazy over. I see a posting of a dunkle daily on Instagram. It's a shoe that's pretty much like a Futura shoe with the uncle characters that I created for Mowax Records in the 90s. And, and I never really liked it. I don't want to blow up the spot and say it was completely unauthorized, but it was a little bit like, oh, oh, you're doing it? Oh, okay, you know, thanks for asking me. Although we invented the pink box. Not so much about all the hype, it's about the content of what is actually there. スニーカーっていうのは多分アートだと思います、うん、とアートであるし多分、まあ、僕にとってなんですけど多分生活の一部ですし僕にとっては、うん、となんかこう情熱があって本当に世界で面白いなこいつらバカなんじゃねえかなっていうことは、まあ、本当に常々やってみたいなみたいな。ナイキさんの方から、まあ、もしあれだったら、まあ、新しいコンセプトで店をやらないかっていうので、まあ、アトモスってお店を、うん、と10年ちょっと前に、うん、と原宿でオープンしたんですよね。Shortly after Atmos opened its doors in 2001, Nike approached Tomio about doing the first ever collaboration on the Air Max 1, a highly sought after shoe in Tokyo. The project was kept under wraps until its release, when it sold out instantly. Yeah, even Nike Japan people doesn't know, you know. First is illegal, but you know, like finally, yeah, Nike Japan say, you know, oh, it's okay, you know. Yeah, you sell. Collaboration was probably 200, 300. Nike, Adidas, Puma, and Reebok. American people, or、yeah, European people, yeah, always yeah, make into their, their historical color. But yeah, I'm yeah, Japanese, so yeah, you know, I'm always using to the different you know, origin, you know? different from to the yeah, American people, European people. Oh, this color is, I like it. American people d o e s n t care, you know? Japanese customer is yeah, more sophisticated. Like this stage, I like it. American people d o e s n t care, you know, stage. We care of the yeah, detail. 多分アメリカの人は、まあ、男だったら例えばジョーダンのレトロがあれば「おおかっこいい!」って言うと思うんですけど日本人は例えば服がジョーダンのレトロに合わなかったらけっかっこよくても決して履かない買わないっていうのがあるんで日本人とアメリカ人の,そのギャップっていうのの隙間をついたのが多分僕の仕事なんだと思うんですよね。Eventually. Homio brought his designs back to the US, where it all started for him. Today, he's widely considered one of the most influential figures in the business. I grew up amongst a culture that really made me who I am. So every time I came around my friends who had the luxury of not. Having any responsibilities and they're hanging on the street, it'd be a joke. And I'd have my uniform on, hey, here's Frank the welder, Frank the mechanic, and it landed on Frank the butcher one day. And, and we all looked at each other and it was, you know, we kept, that, kept it rolling. It started with, you know, I have a rap group and we need a tape cover, we need a t shirt. And I, that's why I started get, getting my chops up, like designing, Photoshop, Illustrator, kind of learning those skills. I was introduced to, the, to concepts, local shop. That was a major player, that is a major player. So it was an amazing opportunity, amazing opportunity. And、um, I took that opportunity and continued to run with it. I think the one that seemed to be the most impactful、um, to the market, but also still my favorite, sometimes that don't happen, right?、Um, is the New Balance 999 Kennedy. The theme was John F. Kennedy's roots in the area and his love for nautical life and sailing. You know, use that as a story and build out the shoe that had materials and colorways that were kind of lent to that nautical story, nautical flags. For us, we were just doing what we're doing. I'm just working on a shoe. But when it came out, it, it became something else. It was gone half a day. 
It released on a Saturday, and by Saturday afternoon, it was gone. In the crustacean world, finding a blue lobster is one in a million chance. So everybody feels the need to tell me. Fishermen call the store and like, I found one. I'm like, yeah, I don't care. I don't even need seafood. The packaging store in the Red Lobster was outstanding, but this one needed to be above and beyond. So here is when we invested uh, a ton of our own money into ensuring that kids would need to have this shoe. We created this whole scare that um, blue lobsters were attacking Boston, uh, eating dogs, killing fishermen, you name it. It took on its own legs, and, and now people were scared. People don't want to go near the beach. We had a kid for the blue lobster. He, it was a six-day line. By the third day, he got a phone call. His girlfriend had been in a car accident back in California, fractured her pelvis, and was in the hospital. This guy flies back, goes and checks on her, and is back in another two days to go wait in the line that his friends had held him a spot in. If that's not dedication, I don't know what is. I've always been sort of a girl immersed in sneaker culture. I grew up dirt poor, not being able to afford like a name brand anything. And I think for a lot of people, when you can't have something as a kid, you sort of grow up with an obsession. And you know, for me, Jordans were always the epitome of cool. It's like the equivalent of having like a BMW like in junior high. And in 2009, I was about to have a birthday party. And I was like, I know what I want my birthday cake to be. I want it to be a giant version of a Jordan 3. This sneaker cake came out and I was so in love with it, I was like, we're not cutting it. A couple months later, I'm just walking through Soho and I run into a friend who had been working at Nike. So going, he tells me he's now at Brand Jordan. And I was like, you should have me design a Jordan. And he was like, what do you mean? You're into Jordans? And I'm like, did you not see my birthday cake? So I show him pictures and he's like, oh my God, you should design a Jordan. And you know, in in the world, people say like, oh, you should do this, we should do, we should have lunch, we should do, you know. Literally, this man called me the next day, had me on the phone with people from Portland, and we were discussing the beginnings of designing this Jordan. The silhouette was the Jordan 2 because it was the 25th anniversary. And so basically that was presented to me as, um, was a Jordan that I got to design. I clearly jumped on it and uh, became the first girl to design a Jordan. This is her. DJing isn't exactly uh, a job where you want to be wearing uncomfortable shoes because you're just, especially when I started, I'd be playing from 10 till 4 in the morning, six hours on your feet. Kind of really just started rocking Supras, the Sky Tops. So I did a collaboration with them. I did the Little Red, which is my nickname. And I did, you know, a Jordan colorway. I did red, black, and white. The second one I did were black and golds. So they were the Indie. And then now I just did the Samikaze. We only do like 400 pairs. I like started sketching shoes around 15, 16. I had turned pro. DC became this real opportunity to evolve the skate footwear market. That first one came out and exploded. At one point I had 30 different shoes that I was getting paid off of, right? Like I designed like a third of the entire line. All right, this is my very first signature shoe. It's one of my favorite colorways, this navy with cream. This thing was uh, really sick. I tried to make more of a running shoe here, but kind of more traditional running shoe style. It didn't work. This thing kept getting bored, kept getting caught on it. Number one rule, I blew it. I blew it. Uh, this one, another major technology move here was the hidden outsole, right? So it wraps around it. I just love the idea of creating this like pure cup sole that looks like a running shoe. Like this, it didn't sell, it didn't sell. Uh, one thing that I did after my 15th shoe, I just took every single one of them and got them all cast in gold. I'm the only person alive with a shoe chain of all their signature shoes. I'm like, what is that? It's my signature shoes in gold. What else is up? Go ahead, man, just wrap your head around it, man. In the sneaker world, you got guys who are really like a and R to the sneaker game. They really, that's what they do. They, they find sneakers. I have a reliable source, I can say. A very reliable source. It's a swag concierge, you know what I mean? Like, hey, you know, can, we, can you get these? And I, I ask, is that a rhetorical question? You know I mean? What do you mean, can I get these? Of course I can get them. Do I want to get them for you? I don't know. Guys 
guys who call and you know they warn you about this shoe. I think I'm gonna have my hands on a retro three number seven next week. Get ready. How much? Uh, I'm still playing with the price. They're like, all right, well, let me give this guy that works there. He's the manager. Let me give him 300 bucks. The joke was, they'd be like, hey, what size are you? Uh, I'm size, size 8 to 13. They're like, what do you mean you're size 8? So give me si size 8 to 13. I don't care what it is. And I would take all the 10 and 10 and a halves, but everything size, you know, 8 to 13, I took because that was how I flipped it. 350 was my rock bottom. I remember one time, even the hall monitor came up to me because they thought I was selling drugs because they saw me give somebody a box of shoes and me take cash. And they were about to arrest me, and I said, no, it's shoes. And then they went and looked in my closet, in my locker, and I just had nothing but Air Jordans because I was importing them and, you know, <laughs> you know, getting different colors from different places in the world, getting things early. From what I sold today, I can buy five amazing shoes and still go home with more money than I can. Who are we to say no? You got extra $300 and I'm, you gonna help me buy these Tiffany's? You want them altitudes? I'm trying to get these De La Souls. They have some stuff that I don't have. So we're gonna do a little barter trade, you know, you know, and it was just, that was the game. For eight years, I did everything solo. And then, boom, you know, I started dealing with people in Japan, dealing with people in Europe, meeting new people in New York, and started creating a bit of a network. And that's what created ProjectBlitz.com. We started with an inventory of 10,000 pairs. Nike Dunks, Air Maxes, Costins, Janoskis, Vans, Supreme, Reebok. 14 years ago, when something was gone, it was gone. ProjectBlitz.com is not only a website. It's like a gallery. It's like art. You're buying it, collecting it, moving this, moving that. And by that, I'm able to keep a few for myself every time. So this is the second part of the warehouse where we have all the Jordans, the Nike, Nike basketball, pennies, KDs. We got these cool Adidas, they're the, they're the money prints. I mean, these are still going probably like three, 4,000 easily. I'm not proud of that reseller label because I, I feel I'm more of a curator than anything else. Without mentioning names, we've had celebrity clientele. Here's the Nike mags, the one that Marty McFly wore in the Back to the Future movie with the light up sole. Great piece, goes for 6,000. The Yeezy Ones, one of the actual sample pairs made for Kanye West himself that he wore on stage. Kobe Jordan 8, hand signed by Kobe himself and game worn. This is the price of uh, a C-Class Mercedes. But the most talked about sale of all time has to be a legendary pair of kicks worn by MJ himself. Most basketball fans will never forget Michael Jordan's famous flu game back in 1997. Now the big story here tonight, the story concerning Michael Jordan's physical conditions. He is suffering from flu-like symptoms. Well, I developed a relationship with him, you know, earlier in the season when they were there in November. Walked up to him because there's no one else around and, you know, it's just asked him, you know, I just said, can I get your kicks after the game? And he kind of looked up at me and I was like, oh, well, am I in trouble? Jordan scored 39 points in the pivotal game five between the Bulls and the Jazz, cementing his legacy and providing Preston with a one-of-a-kind opportunity. After the game, there was, it was craziness in the locker room. Obviously, they had just won, and a couple times people would come and reach down and grab the shoes, and he was like, no, 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 those are for him, and he pointed over at me, and that's when I was like, wow, he's, he remembered. It was a couple weeks after I started looking for a safety deposit box, and that's where they've been sitting ever since. Well, the shoes that he wore on that day hit the auction block, and they just sold for a stunning $105,000. Really? Yeah. It's crazy to think that, you know, a pair of shoes could fetch that much money. Sneakerheads is a cult fueled by the internet. Nike really has controlled the amount of pairs of Jordan that go into the marketplace. The whole success there is built on unrequited demand, meaning that there's never enough supply to meet the demand. Sneaker fanatics are lining up all over the country to grab a pair. Hundreds of people were standing in line for hours to pay a hundred... With the mega success of the Jordan line, Nike mastered the art of the limited release. In the early 90s, Wednesdays, which later moved to Saturdays, took on new meaning for collectors, as this was the day the newest models debuted. This led to the camping out phenomenon, where obsessive sneakerheads would spend two or three nights on the sidewalk, year-round, awaiting the most desired models. It's hype. It's hype from the media, it's hype from your friends, and it's just hype from your community. It's a combination of people that are genuine enthusiasts, it's people that just like to be fly, 
people that are in OD in the sports, and then you got people that are just bastardized and just trying to jump onto a current wave. They'll camp out for a, a night or a week. They'll pay exorbitant prices to a reseller or on eBay um, so that they can be validated as cool. I don't get it. All these people are online for sneakers? Oh, yeah. Some of them probably even camped out all night for sneakers. Vince, these ain't just sneakers. These are limited edition Fuki Jamas. Fuki what us? Ah, Vince. Months in advance, you're learning about these releases. These foam posits are only going to be released in Orlando because the All-Star Games there. Got to camp out these three locations. The sneaker that's available today will probably be sold out tomorrow. People have this sense of urgency, this sense of if I don't get it now, I'm never going to be able to get it. Because people will come around like 2 o'clock AM, and then people start lining up, and then the hype just builds on hour after hour. And it's just supply does not equal the demand. And most of the limited release Jordans, and when I say limited release, can be as much as four or 500,000 pairs. Um, those shoes sell out in a day. And that gets the kids all fired up for the next shoe that comes out. They're trying now lottery systems. They're, they're, they tried to have people sign up by Twitter. Back when I did the pigeon dunk, in the entire Nike Corporation, there was probably four people that handled limited edition product at Nike. Now it's like an entire building at Nike campus with hundreds of employees. All they do is think about limited edition product. But what kept so-called sneakerheads in line from coast to coast was the signature foot gears out of this world resale price. With limited supply, resale prices escalated, creating a new breed of sneakerhead, the reseller. Retail is $240. The resale is between 15 to three, maybe up to 4,500. So if you're gonna pay me a couple thousand to sit outside for a couple hours, I'll be sitting right here. This doctor's not making money like this right now. A sneakerhead is so obsessed with sneakers that they're willing to forego paying the rent to say they own a shoe that they will never wear. Mayhem at the mall this morning, two days before Christmas. It was chaos all over a pair of Michael Jordan tennis shoes. And the crowd got so unruly this morning that officers had to step in with pepper spray. Riot police tried to calm nearly a thousand shoppers outside of a shoe store. Unfortunately, the marriage of the hype and the explosion in resale prices led to a predictable dark side. Several people were trampled while others crawled over them to get inside. Violence associated with sneaker releases has cropped up across the country. You know, growing up here in New York, we've seen the kids getting jacked for their sneakers. You know, that was a, a normal thing. You see a dude on the subway and he's got no shoes on, you know he got his sneakers taken. It brought a lot of jealousy. It brought a lot of, you know, envy when it comes to you got a Jordan and I don't have a Jordan. There's some deep down, like, need, desire to be seen in, in something, you know, clean or fresh or something that is desired or something that's highly covered. That's the desperation of today's youth. That's. That's a desperation that is pretty sad. That, that starts at home. That's not even about sneakers. That's about home. There's always been people wanting what they can't have. It's just an unfortunate thing that happens with any time you have something that people want. No one asks the president of GM to do something about carjacking. But it didn't surprise me that kids would become violent and, and uh, really ferocious about these shoes because the way they market them, they marketed them as, as if they're the dream. They can absolutely be more responsible. They can change their release schedule. They can change how the shoes are released. The shoe company should be able to grasp that they have control of what can and can't happen. The question is, are they willing to take a step back in time? 
it's a really touchy subject because in business, oh, people are lining up for my product. People are so excited about my product going out that they're making websites, they're taking pictures, they're sharing their friends. Like, that's what you want in business, right? But you never want it to cross that line where people are killing each other for your product. No one around, hot on the floor. Feel the shadow watching from an open door. Praying for the sirens, but I'm all alone. In December, my son went on a Monday morning to purchase a raffle ticket in order to get the new Bread 11s that were going to be coming out December the 21st. They went to the mall, purchased the shoes, had no problem. They were being followed and stalked. The strange car shadowed them to their neighborhood and opened fire on the young men. Joshua was shot in the head and died later that night. My son was 22 years old when his life was taken asking Lord, wishing that it was me in his place instead of him because he has a son to look out for. You have individuals that are charged with capital murder because of this incident. Their life is gone. Their family is going through something. I will forever feel this pain. I will forever go through this. And that has that is what inspired me to come up with the organization Life Over Fashion. Every single year, somebody's life is taken over a pair of shoes. You wanna make sure that when your child or even you go purchase these shoes, you don't have to worry about anyone gonna hurt you. You don't have to worry about the violence associated with it. For a while, they were releasing shoes at midnight. They found out that people were a lot more aggressive at midnight than they were at 8 o'clock in the morning, so they moved the releases to 8 o'clock in the morning to try to keep, to keep some of the uh, uh, rowdiness down. And it's worked, but it hasn't been eliminated totally. It is an issue, and I, I think it's, there's no magical solution right now. With my persistence, Nike did contact me. I spoke with one of the VPs of Nike, and to this day, we are in constant communication. I actually spoke with Michael Jordan. He gave his condolences, and I asked him, could we meet and talk about a solution? Just outside of Portland, Oregon, there's a special place where sneakers are doing some real good and even creating a market of their own. Dornbecker Children's Hospital is a, a full-service tertiary care of children's hospital. We take care of kids with cancer, kids with kidney disease and needing kidney transplantation. The Dornbecker Freestyle is a, a big fundraising program for us here at the hospital, and it started when a Nike executive joined our board. His son suggested, why don't you have Nike design a shoe and sell it? That morphed into the idea of having patients design the shoes. It's grown from a very small program to now one of our major fundraisers. In 2012, I got to design a Nike shoe, and then I was one of the freestyle kids. We went to a meeting and they gave me a big stack of papers with the shoe style and the bottom of the shoe and I got to decorate it however I wanted. So I designed the Nike foam positive ones that they hand you a shoe to design and then you get to go home for about a month to work on it then you meet with them again. After the review day, the next morning, he walked up and he was shocked to see so many followers start following him on Instagram, and he was kind of confused. Shoelaces are like bubbly, that's why I chose them. And they have stars right here, and then on the side, you like there's like these stars with peace signs in it. I chose red because I went through a blood cancer, and blood is red, and to me, that was a no brainer. It's kind of like a ballet flat material right here in this area. And the Nike swoosh is really sparkly. 
On the insole of the shoe, I have a bracelet design that I got on my 13th birthday, and my parents gave it to me. And it, to me, it remains family and strength and connection, and that really helped me get through my treatment. On the day we visited the hospital, we brought along Kansas City Royals starting pitcher and sneakerhead Jeremy Guthrie for a surprise visit. There's something cool that you might uh, be able to break in and have ready for your season come spring. Thank you so much. You think that's cool? Yes. We should go out and toss a little bit. Thank you so much. Nice, that's real good. The kids who get picked to design the shoes come back years later and still talking about what a great experience that was and how meaningful that was to them and to their families. The shoe design was really cool. It, it kind of helped us, you know, take all the bad sides of this and have some fun. We thought it was just designing the shoes and, you know, hopefully money goes to Don Becker, but it was much more than that. <laughs> a sneakerhead is me, a Dornbecker designer and a 15-year-old kid. The sneakerhead subculture grows larger by the day, but now collectors are not just hunched over their computers. There is absolutely a community created by sneakers. With the simultaneous explosion of social media and the now endless supply of limited edition kicks, near mythic personalities have emerged. These gatekeepers are able to connect the dots and tell the story of how certain shoes came to be. More importantly, they tend to separate that which is truly special from that which is merely new. You have this worldwide almost competition where if you have an Instagram or a Twitter, I mean, you're posting whatever you're wearing every single day. On Instagram, if you like follow like Dunk Exchange or like people with like a lot of sneakers, they'll like post them and like say like the price or like something like how much you can get them for. Hundreds or thousands, depending on who you are, people are seeing that. So, you know, there's almost more pressure to have something new almost every single day, which of course winds up with people having 100 pairs of shoes. On any given weekend in cities around the globe, obsessive sneaker collectors commune with one another to buy, sell, and trade their most coveted kicks. The new hunt is on. Just as the shoes are marketed constantly to eager consumers, so too are these gatherings that attract thousands of like-minded sneakerheads looking for a fix. Oftentimes, in, in mainstream culture, we're sort of casted out as freaks who buy hundreds of pairs of shoes and like resell them, so to come here and not have to explain why you do what you do or why you love what you love, it's nice to be able to do that, you know? <laughs> two pair, come on. <laughs> I can't do this one bro. Come on, 220. And I'll put you in a movie. I started sneaker pins back in 2002 in Australia when, you know, there was no sneaker events anywhere. When we first started, the crowd was in their early 20s up to 30s. I think now, it's a lot of the younger kids, the younger generation has picked up the culture and kind of moved along with that. It's sometimes a little bit mysterious. Like, you never know what's going to work. You know that shoe, even if it's ugly as sin, it's going to be selling for $500, $600, $700 the next day. And you keep inspiring people, man. You always have been, right? Thank you. Good to see you, brother. Right. It's going to be hard to expand the business. People's closets are full. Storage units are full. Consignment shops are full. At some point, it's like, how many more shoes can you sell to the same kids? You know, I own a store, so I just see people coming in that last year weren't shopping for sneakers at all, you know what I mean? So I think it's just gonna keep growing and growing. I've never seen people like my mom wear free and fly knits and bright colored soles on their shoes. If you open up the Chinese market, if you figure out India, the trick is selling to different people, not selling similar products to the same people. Recently, with the popularity of sneaker culture, it's really obvious now that you have all these high-end companies that are doing sneakers that they've never done before. Rich people walk into Gucci and buy Gucci sneakers because they have Gucci sneakers. Not because they automatically were like, oh my god, they're the most amazing sneakers. They were like, OK, we have sneakers for us. This is like the highest labor cost in the world, you know, the highest 
material cost, the rubber's the best, the hardware's the best. You're getting your money's worth, 100%, maybe 150%. I think I could sell these shoes for double the price and we'd sell just as much. I like it. It provides an opportunity for um, some sneaker enthusiasts to evolve. A lot of us is, is, is pushing 30 now. A lot of us is getting families and falling in, in real love. You know what I'm saying? And like, you, you just kind of want to look at your pictures back then and look at them now and, and see some type of growth. The streets have been referencing the high end since day one. I just think now it's nice that there's an open dialogue and a conversation happening, you know? Besides being an enormous business, the sneaker culture is now an integral part of so many different worlds, from fashion to music to sport. Kicks are everywhere. Sneakers has always been a reflection of like who you want to be, who you believe you are, uh, or where you come from. How you're going to represent yourself and how you're going to portray yourself to the world through footwear is what sneaker culture is all about, really. That's the bottom line. Shoes define who you are. You know, sneakers are the status symbol for a generation that other generations don't understand. I've had experiences with people who, like, I'll see someone staring at my feet, and I got some, you know, whatever, retros on, and I'm giving a motherfucker a flashback. The young kids are like, man, you got them old schools on. And, and, and the old schools is like, man. With a lot of sneakers, and especially the retro market, you have people who are grown trying to buy things that either they had when they were a kid or they wanted when they were a kid. I appreciate something because it looks good, it's well designed. All of the normal reasons that you would appreciate something, but I also have the other appreciation because I lived through it. Without getting a Harley Davidson or a convertible or looking like some guy with a midlife crisis, I think a way that you could really retain that youth is with sneaker culture. It's an opportunity for people to stay connected to, you know, the life they had when, you know, maybe things were less complicated. Me taking home that shoe kind of signified things will be better. You know what I mean? My moms and my pops ain't getting along. They ain't together. And I'm living in the hood. I'm in the worst part of the city and the worst part of times, you know, late 80s. And this was like a beacon of hope. A lot of us who fell in love with sneakers at one point are, uh, we're getting to an age where you're just like, fuck, I can't wear a pair of wingtips. And so that love of, you know, sneakers is, it's gonna stay with a generation all the way. Every time I break open a pair of shoes, man, like, I feel like a kid again, you know, like, I'm lacing, I'm lacing it really carefully, and I used to do that when I was in sixth grade, you know what I mean? And I still do it that way to this day. I'm 39 years old now. I think I'm gonna feel that way for the rest of my life. What is a sneakerhead? I have no idea. I'm just a guy who likes sneakers a little more enthusiastically than you. Frank Rivera, AKA Frank the Butcher, Boston, Massachusetts. My name is Jeff Staple. I'm the founder and creative director of Staple Design and Reed Space. My name is Elliot Curtis. I'm 26. I'm the co-founder of Sneakerology 101. I am Brooklyn's finest, New York's giant, God's favorite DJ. My name is Clark Kent. I'm from Brooklyn. I'm Russ Bankson, and I'm the sneaker editor of Complex Magazine. Yeah, Hidehumi Hongyo. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, yeah, I live in Tokyo. My name is Lenny McGurr, Leonard McGurr. I'm uh, from New York, uh, and my artist name is Futura. And thank you. <laughs> they gonna judge you for life. Say we can always be fly. We gonna be good as long as them sneakers wide. You be good.